Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Andrea Olive, who is of the Department of Political Science and, and the Department of Geography at U of T Mississauga. She is uh, works on species at risk policy. Um, I first encountered Andrea's work when I found her paper, which I was like, I, I, when I read it, I, I was not sure why I had not read it before. <laughs> I couldn't, hadn't found it before, but I reached out to her on, I think I reached out to you on Twitter. And um, anyway, it becomes clear that her research interests are obviously dovetailed quite neatly with what we're doing with our zoo work. And uh, I've been contemplating trying to get her to come up and give a talk or to figure some way to interact with her. And this seemed like a great opportunity to have her come and speak to us about her work on um, species at risk policy and the role of zoos. So Andrea, thank you. All right, thank you very much. <coughs> Okay, um, so I'm very, uh, very happy to be here. Um, I have a very bad cold, so I apologize. Um, nothing I can do about it though. Um, I'm going to <coughs> talk today a bit, give you a bit of background on species service policy in Canada, because I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that. And then I wanna talk about the project we did looking at what Canadian zoos are doing um, for species at risk uh, conservation, why they're doing it, and sort of tying it back into the policy uh, aspect. So species at risk policy in Canada um, is somewhat complicated because of this thing called federalism, right? So our federal government only has jurisdiction in Canada over federal lands, some migratory birds, the ones under the Migratory Bird Act of the United States, and some aquatic species. Um, and so federal land is not that much land in the country, actually. Outside of the Northern, Ter Northern Territories, federal land is only about 10% of the land across all the provinces. So federal governments, the Species at Risk Act, right, can apply to that land. We're talking like Indian reserves, military bases, national parks, like the post office. So if you're a species at risk and you find yourself at one of those, you find yourself at the post office, right, the federal government can protect you. Otherwise, if you're off federal land, right, it's up to the provinces. So it's, it, this is really a story of shared and overlapping jurisdiction. Um, again, the federal government would have <coughs> authority over any migratory bird on the Migratory Bird Act and then some commercially viable fish. Um, and so we have this national 2002 Species at Risk Act, but it applies, right, only to federal land. So our national law, right, is only being implemented on federal land. So we can list species all across the entire country, but the federal government can only protect them on federal land. Otherwise, in the provinces, right, the provinces and territories have jurisdiction over provincial crown land or private land. So private property is a provincial issue, provincial crown lands are provincial. So that's the vast majority of land in Canada. That makes the provinces responsible for conservation species at risk on those lands. And that really leads to 13 disjoint policies which I'll get to in a minute. I just qu really quickly sort of uh, want to mention that our federal government does have this thing called the safety net clause, which means when it thinks the province isn't doing a good enough job um, protecting a species, it will go in and do it through federal authority. That's only happened twice in the history of Canada. Once was for the greater sage grouse uh, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and once was for the western coarse frog in Quebec. Um, but that is not something the federal government does very often through the Species at Risk Act. Might do it for the caribou, um, we see a lot of that. If you're on Twitter, you probably see EcoJustice tweeting about that every day, trying to get the safety net invoked for the caribou. Um, in terms of how SARA works, and I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but our Species at Risk Act really relies on COSAWIC, so the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. They assess all flora and fauna across the country. And they give it a status, right? It's endangered, it's threatened, special concern, not at risk, data deficient whatever status they give it, right, the, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada <coughs> has nine months to make a decision about whether or not to put it on SARA with that status. Nine months elapses and there's no decision, it automatically gets put on to SARA with the status given to it by COSAWIC. Otherwise, the minister can ask for more information or, uh, or reject, actually, uh, what COSAWIC has said. Um, if it gets listed, the minister then has a year if it's an endangered species, or two years if it's a threatened species, to write a recovery strategy. Okay, and it's that point that habitat becomes uh, listed and protected, and to do this, you're drawing on best available science, on indigenous knowledge, and on local knowledge. Um, so community-based knowledge. Um, 
so again, this is just for, these are just for uh, the threatened and endangered species. If it's a special concern, they write a management plan, but there's no timeline for that. Uh, after a recovery strategy has been made, the minister must then prepare an action plan. And as you can guess, right, that's when they actually put something into action. So you have a recovery strategy and says, right, here's the species, here's what it eats, here's how it mates, here's where it lives, right? It's sort of all that information, here's why it's endangered. The action plan actually lays out steps and it considers politics, economics, everything, uh, all taken into consideration. Here's what we're actually going to do for the species. We only have about 12 of these in existence, so very few action plans have ever been produced, um, mostly going back to that problem of land, right? The federal government doesn't have any authority. The things that are actually causing harm are not under privy of the federal government or what's needed to recover the species, the federal government doesn't control. So it can only I enforce this law on federal lands. And really from 2006 to 2016, the federal government was not producing any recovery strategies or action plans at all. It was very slow to get these documents out and they're now starting to come out uh, more quickly. In terms of the provinces and the territories, um, we had a 1996 accord for the protection of species at risk in all the provinces except for Quebec signed on to this accord saying that they would make uh, some sort of endangered species policy for their province and it would be consistent across all 13 jurisdictions and consistent with the federal government. Today we have seven standalone endangered species policies in this country. We have four provinces, well three provinces and one territory that has no policy at all for endangered species. Does anyone want to guess what those provinces are? British Columbia. British Columbia is one of them. So we have no policy for endangered species. No prizes here. There's that you don't get it, but no New risk Brunswick. in what? New Brunswick. No, New Brunswick has one. Alberta. Yeah, Alberta's another one. Quebec. You're, you're, they're moving in the right. No, Quebec. Quebec was an early adopter, actually. You think because they didn't sign the accord, they were like, we don't need your accord. We already have policies. Yeah. <laughs> So you got, we got British Columbia, we have Alberta, what else is over there? Got Saskatchewan, and then looking yeah. northward, the Yukon. So those are the four jurisdictions that have nothing. All of Western Canada, right? Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, Yukon, no policy at all for endangered species. They protect endangered species if they do it all under their Wildlife Act, under Forestry Act, like hunting regulations, really. They're not protecting habitat, they're not writing recovery plans, okay. BC is maybe going to create its own. There's been talk since the NDP Green Party government came into power. Um, and I'll, I'll just note, um, and we'll come back because I'm going to talk about the Assiniboia Zoo. Uh, Manitoba did something a little different two years ago. It enacted uh, an Endangered Species and Ecosystems Act, meaning they're the only province right now where you can list an entire ecosystem as endangered, and they put policy into place to go after protecting ecosystems instead of going after individual species. Um, <coughs> Okay, so over, right, this is this 2013 report was a very famous report by the David Suzuki Foundation in Ecojustice where they like gave a grade to all the provinces uh, and universally everyone was pretty much doing crappy. All the West is failing this hard, right? And then sort of the, the big gold star was Ontario with, with our C plus. Um, Ontario has the Endangered Species Act of 2007. I mean, if I was to regrade the provinces today, I think I would upgrade Manitoba uh, since they came out with their new legislation, I would downgrade Ontario, right? Ontario gave an exemption to every industry in the province. So it creates an Endangered Species Act, but then it immediately exempts forestry, mining, hydroelectricity, every big industry from the main provisions of the law. So, I mean, that's right, that's a problem from a, a conservation standpoint. Uh, but still does have a, a pretty strange Endangered Species Act. So why are we doing so bad with conservation policy in Canada? Why would the Quebec class average be a C minus? Um, <coughs> really, it's a failure to list species. So most provinces aren't even listing uh, a, a species at risk, aren't putting things on the endangered species list. Uh, and then most importantly, this failure to protect habitat. So we're not, we're, we're doing okay when it's like national parks or provincial parks or when we're, it's on provincial lands but really struggling when it comes to privately managed land. So getting private landowners to steward species at risk has been a big challenge both in Canada and the United States. I did my initial PhD work in the United States looking, interviewing private landowners there to talk to them about how can we change what they're doing on their own land to get them 
to conserve endangered species and then have subsequently started doing that in Canada. And that's really been what I've worked on. So how can we manipulate really or convince landowners to manage land differently? So I've spent a lot of time traveling around Canada, the United States, interviewing farmers, ranchers, people who own small parcels of land, big parcels of land uh, across both countries. And that has been primarily my life's work. But in 2016, I had uh, a student walk into my life, um, a student come into my office, plunk, plunk down and say, uh, I want to study CSER risk. And this is great, right? This is one of the best things about being uh, a professor, being a teacher, right? You get to uh, interact with young people who are interested in the things that you're interested in. And so I, you know, I get to talking to Katrina and I'm asking her like, well, what have you done so far? Like, what was your undergrad degree in? What do you think you want to do after you graduate? That type of stuff. And she's talking to me and Katrina mentions that she used to work at the Calgary Zoo. She was a summer student there. She really loved it. And she thinks she might want to work at a zoo when she's done, like after she's graduated. And I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that's really interesting. Um, did you, like, what do zoos do for species at risk? Did you work on species at risk stuff? And she's like, yeah, I, I don't know, actually. I have no idea what, what zoos do. And it's kind of quiet for a little while, and I don't say anything. I just kind of let, like, the awkwardness, like, just wash over us and the silence there. And then her face kind of lights up, and she's like, I could find out. I could find out what zoos do for species at risk. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what you should do. That is exactly what you should do, Katrina. So that is what she ended up doing her uh, MA thesis on in geography at the University of Toronto, her project, The Role of Canadian Zoos and Aquaria in Species at Risk Conservation. And so the big picture project that her and I had mapped out that we wanted to look at, uh, which is fairly uh, ambitious, uh, and I'm definitely not going to talk about it all today. We've published some of it. Some of it is still a work in progress. Um, but really to just try to look at the multitude of ways that zoos are uh, trying to <coughs> do work with species at risk in Canada, um, examine participation in captive breeding and reintroduction. That was sort of Katrina's uh, big sort of, that's where she thought they would be doing a lot of work. Um, of course, also around research. So what type of research was happening at zoos? How were they engaging uh, like actual research by zoo staff? And then sort of we know there's a lot of literature out there already on education and awareness programs at zoos, but also not a lot for Canadian zoos, not a lot of research on that. So maybe documenting a bit about the types of education programs um, or awareness programs that are happening in Canadian zoos. And then finally, if we could somehow link this thing that Katrina is really interested in to a lot of the work that I've been doing on recovery strategies in, in Canada, so how did the zoos participate at all with species at risk? Uh, with, with SARA and with provincial uh, recovery documents, federal recovery documents, and then perhaps maybe even internationally, which we weren't sure how involved Canadian zoos were. And so we ended up choosing four zoos for case studies. Um, we excluded the ones in Quebec, because unfortunately neither of us speak French well enough to have gone and done interviews with zoo staff there or to go through all sort of the gray literature, the budgets uh, for those zoos. So we <coughs> ended up excluding the Montreal Biodome and the Granby Zoo uh, in Quebec, as well as the aquarium that just opened in Toronto. Um, it's just so new that it seems sort of unfair to expect it to have already been a you know, world-class research institution or expected to already be engaged with recovery uh, strategies or teams in Canada. So we excluded it and we instead focus on these four, which really are the oldest, largest zoos in Canada, the Winnipeg, the Assiniboia Zoo, Park Zoo, Calgary Zoo, Toronto Zoo, and Vancouver Aquarium. And <coughs> we did literature review for these four, uh, peer-reviewed literature, gray literature, you know, websites. There, We had sort of ideas about going through all their Facebook um, and their Twitter and like looking at their public image, and uh, but we, we never sort of ended up getting through that um, part of the project. We did do semi-structured interviews at each of these zoos, 24 in total, uh, <coughs> almost even across the whole zoo, but uh, seven in, in Calgary and five in Toronto, and then uh, an exhibit uh, participant observation uh, that I will talk about. So in terms of thinking about this presentation in, in three sort of parts here, the first one being what, are they, what were these do, zoos doing for wildlife management? What was actually happening at the zoos um, <coughs> for species at risk? So looking at um, the case studies, right, we can see 
Um, can I get this to, okay, okay, so we have the zoos, right? Their total, the total species that they have, the number that are Canadian species, the number that are listed on a species at risk act or a provincial act, um, and then the number, uh, or sorry, this is uh, the red list, so this is internationally how many at-risk species, and then how many native or at-risk Canadian listed species, so ones on provincial or the federal. Um, for the Vancouver Aquarium, they don't categorize their uh, species this way. Talk to them in person, we talk to them over email. They do have at-risk species at the Vancouver Aquarium, and I'll talk about some of the programs that they have running there. They just don't, um, they just don't know how many are listed on Sarah or how many listed, well, there is no Birch Columbia Act, so how many would be listed uh, on Sarah. But they do have uh, Canadian at-risk species there, and they are running programs for them. Uh, in terms of captive breeding, so we've already heard a bit about captive breeding, reintroduction, and head starting, but you know where they're actually breeding them in the zoo for captivity, where they're breeding them, reintroducing them into the wild, or where they're head starting. So they're taking um, either pregnant or very young species and getting them through a vulnerable stage of their life, right? So when they're uh, only a few months, a few years old, to just rear them in captivity and then re-release them into the wild. So we can see, right, um, these these. Uh, species and captive breeding, all, all of them were running quite a few, the Toronto Zoo the most there. Um, reintroduction programs, all zoos had at least some reintroduction and then head starting programs were certainly less so. Um, <coughs> well, and we, you know, we just heard a talk about this, well they used to be solely taking in animals to sell tickets, right, for exhibits. Um, <coughs> all four of these institutions talked to us about um, how in, and even quite recently, but in sort of the last 25 years, there has been a focus on breeding animals now for conservation. So beyond just trying to either uh, keep having new babies that are cute and will bring in more visitors, right, which is something uh, everyone loves baby animals, like when those baby pandas were at the Toronto Zoo, everyone had to go see the pandas, like that type of thing, right, that, that baby animals bring in more money. Um, but moving away from that and moving away even just from for exhibits, but actually for conservation purposes, zoos are uh, putting more attention towards that. Reintroduction programs that are happening. Um, so right now, the Assiniboia uh, Park Zoo, and this is something we learned only uh, after we had gone there, um, but their research wing of their zoo is actually fairly new, and so they're only getting into this type of uh, more conservation-oriented uh, programs more recently, but right now they're only involved in the burrowing owl reintroduction program. But you can see all the zoos are doing something with reintroduction. I believe we are maybe going to hear about uh, Vancouver Aquarium's uh, Oregon Spotted Fog uh, and the Northern Leopard Frog uh, programs in one of our later speakers. Um, but there certainly is a lot going on, and it does tend to be for native species. Um, and these zoos, when we talk to them, when we talk to zoo staff, you know, they, they talked about putting animals back into the wild as being a new, like something that zoos should be doing, something that they wanted to be involved in. Uh, and also though, that they wanted to protect species that were in their own backyard, that they wanted to protect species that were endangered in their home province. Um, so in terms of some examples, from a success story here with reintroduction, I think probably most famously, and probably one you've all heard, is the whooping crane. Um, and this has been a huge project ha happening at the Calgary Zoo for numerous years. They're the only Canadian breeding facility. Um, there's lots of facilities, though, in the United States that have been working on the whooping crane project. So we know whooping cranes hit uh, their sort of their lowest numbers in the 1930s, 1940s, just 15 wild individuals in 1941. And today, right, we have four wild flock species um, <coughs> that are basically thriving. Uh, Louisiana's flock just had its very first uh, chick born into the wild um, since 1939. It was born in 2015. So the, the wood buffalo uh, flock is up to 329. The eastern migratory flock is up to 105 individuals, respectively. And the work of the Calgary Zoo has been central, right? So it's not clear if this program would have been successful had the Calgary Zoo not been involved in uh, the captive breeding and the reintroduction of the, of the whooping cranes. But I don't want to give you the impression that reintroduction works all the time, because it certainly doesn't. Um, the reintroduction of species can be very difficult for lots of uh, reasons, 
um, particularly after you've had something in captivity and released in the wild, it's not necessarily going to make it, right? But there's all types of things that can go wrong in these projects. And one example, uh, which is not the zoo's fault, but one example uh, is the Toronto Zoo's <coughs> black-footed ferret reintroduction program into the Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan. Um, and here, so, they, so um, black-footed ferrets were thought to be extinct, and then they found a population in Wyoming, and so they started to do captive breeding in zoos in the United States, um, and then they were reintroducing these ferrets uh, into, um, into the Western United States, and the Toronto Zoo tried to reintroduce them into Saskatchewan, into the Grasslands National Park. So again, this is federally protected land, the species at risk should apply, all should work seamlessly, there should be no problem, even though Saskatchewan doesn't have any law to protect um, endangered species. But what ends up happening is they introduce them in 2009 and then a plague arrives and devastates the prairie dog population. And so you can't have black-footed ferrets without prairie dogs, right? That's their main source of food. So it just, they then died, right? So we have no um, black-footed ferrets in Grasslands National Park. Um, they are an extirpated species from Saskatchewan and prairie dogs are listed <coughs> as endangered uh, federally anyway in Saskatchewan. Um, but until that population rebounds, right, there's no chance that a reintroduction program is going to work uh, inside Saskatchewan. Um, okay, so well, so that is what they were doing in terms of their captive breeding, reintroduction. I guess I didn't talk about head starting so much, but that program as well. So turning and looking, what are these zoos doing with recovery, um, the recovery process? So we looked at federal recovery strategies, provincial recovery strategies, and then zoos participating in higher level recovery processes, so internationally. A bit about why would zoos do this um, and the challenges that they face. So how we did this, well, essentially what we did was we took every species that's listed on the Species at Risk Act federally, which is only like 650 species, um, and we looked at the ones in British Columbia, um, in Alberta, in Manitoba and in Ontario, so we're the actual home provinces of the zoos. Um, and we looked to see if any of those federal species at risk recovery documents, so whether it was a recovery plan, an action plan, or a management plan, whether it mentioned a zoo. So this was a species that has a recovery plan up in, you know, published out there in the world. Do they talk about zoos at all? Is the federal government looking to zoos, including zoos? Is this something that zoos are, or aquariums, um, are helping with? And then we did the same uh, process with provincial recovery strategies. We have to exclude Manitoba here because Manitoba does not write provincial <coughs> recovery strategies. So they're a province that just doesn't, um, that's not the approach that they take to recovering species at risk, so there's no documents for us to look at. So we looked at British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario to pro provincially produced documents ever mention zoos or aquariums. Um, and then when we found those, we look to see, so what were zoos doing? So 30, federally, there are 31 recovery documents that mention zoos. That, I don't know. I don't know if I think that's a lot or if I think that's not enough. Um, I mean, you have to keep in mind that some of the federally listed species would be like plants or um, could be you know, like moss, or it could be something that zoos um, maybe are going to be less likely to be involved in. Um, like only 31 of 314 suggest that maybe we're underutilizing zoos. But at the same time, I think, well, 31, you know, species at risk have a zoo involved in their recovery. That's great. That's, you know, like that's, um, that's actually a success or that's a, that's a good thing. So I'm not exactly sure if I think that there's not enough zoos or if it's, uh, if it's good news. But in terms of what were zoos doing, they were captive breeding species. So of the 31, 13 were being captively bred. So we are, are actually have zoos that are breeding species at risk for the pop like for assurance populations, right? For potentially re-releasing them into the wild. Um, and then we have a case where uh, zoo members are on the recovery team and then um, it, where they are providing education and public outreach. So this, this one uh, is way too low. Probably zoos could be doing a lot more in terms of providing education and outreach, but I will get to that uh, in a minute. 
Uh, in terms of provincial recovery, so only 14 of the 235 provincial recovery strategies mention these zoos. This might be a bit of our methodology. So again, we only looked in the, the zoo's home province, but there's no reason that the Toronto Zoo can't be doing something for like the Northwest Territories, right? Or like, so I think this is partly the way we went about doing it. We would need to do a much more systematic look at every single recovery strategy action plan, management plan that exists at the provincial level for every species across all provinces and get a whole entire data set and then keyword search for zoo. Uh, so that's something I would still like to do, but if we look at just the home provinces for those three um, zoos, there's only 235 documents and 14 mention a zoo. Again, the, the most common things were zoo staff was a recovery team member. Um, the zoos were again doing captive breeding or they were doing education or outreach. In terms of high level recovery, this we really got more through doing interviews with uh, staff at the zoo. So they were, a lot of the staff is like, yeah, we're involved. In fact, we're over involved, right? We're being asked all the time to serve on all kinds of committees. So they're sometimes being asked by like the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, hey, can you be on this committee? Can you be on this recovery team? Um, or with Environment Can and Climate Change Canada, um, international committees through ADZA, through CASA, you know, like they are um, certainly doing a, a lot and we don't have a systematic way um, to document it. I would like to do a survey with zoo staff um, to get a better sense of uh, what, what, how zoo staff are being engaged in all of these different, because I think there's a lot of examples where Canadian uh, zoo staff are doing a lot um, in the United States and a lot internationally. Um, and it would also give us a better sense of some of the challenges. Like a lot of zoo staff is like, I would love to get more involved in all of these things, but like I just don't have the time. We don't have the resources. Um, so yes, I've been asked to serve on these committees. I've been ex asked to go speak at these conferences or whatever, but we simply, I can't get more involved. I'm just, we just don't have the resources. Um, how do they, how do these zoos participate in education and awareness? So these, the, the past two things I've talked to you about, we've, we've published that data, that's out there. This data, um, we haven't, and in part because uh, I think it might be a bit uh, unfair to the zoos, um, we, don't, I, we didn't assess any way how effective this education is, but just simply sort of what is going on inside the zoos. So 23 of the 24 people we interviewed said, they really felt that zoos have an important role in, like, to play in education and raising awareness, as you would expect. Um, they definitely felt that zoos have this, like, really, they're uniquely situated to connect people um, to nature uh, and potentially even lead to, like, lifestyle changes or that going to a zoo or bringing children to a zoo can be, like, a life-changing event um, and that it really um, should inspire people um, to become more engaged with conservation. And so <coughs> what we did here, uh, and really what we could get ethics approval for, um, because zoo, this often involves children, right, because that's one of the main visitors to the zoo, uh, we did participant observation. So basically sitting and watching a zoo exhibit and asking, um, so we look at the sign ourselves, right? Does it mention the status of the animal? Does it mention what the zoo is doing? Um, does it provide any details about efforts to conserve it? Does it say where the animal lives in the wild? And does it say how, like, the public, what the, what the person reading the sign can actually do? Um, and so we did this, uh, it was usually Tuesday or Wednesday afternoons at the zoo, five exhibits uh, at each of the uh, institutes. Um, and so 20 total, right, sitting there for half an hour, what, counting the number of people that come up, okay, how many of them read the sign, right? We also have how many of them talked to somebody else while at the exhibit, how long did they stay at the exhibit for? It got kind of crazy because sometimes there was actually a lot of people, even though it was like a Tuesday afternoon at the zoo. Um, but uh, in terms of the signs themselves, so 12 of them mentioned the status of the animal, 14 mentioned the zoo conservation project, and these are all for like species at risk, the ones we chose, right? So they, like, t technically the zoo could be getting 20 out of 20, like, on these ones. Details of the zoo project for 13, the, the wild habitat 
for the species, 19 of the signs mention it. What the public can do to help was nine of those signs mention it. And then in terms of, um, so what we did, right, is the so over the five exhibits, the two days that we did this, how many people actually um, came up, so how many visitors were there, and out of that, how many do we think actually read the sign? So it's ki that's kind of like a judgment call because someone's like reading, it's like, we, you didn't read that whole thing. You looked at that for like 10 seconds, right? So that does that count as reading it or not reading it? So again, like, I mean, this is a part why it's not published. Um, I do think this is useful information, particularly brainstorming. Love to see a student pick up on this work and, and try and implement this project more systematically at a zoo. Um, but really, the numbers here are quite low in terms of how are people, like, are people reading this sign, right? In total, only about 16, 17% of people were actually reading this information. So thinking that maybe signs aren't the best way to get this information across. Um, so we also decided to look at the education programs that these zoos were involved in, so bringing in kids to the zoo. And this is telling you um, like what the program is and then what age group it's geared towards. So grades one to six, there's like a polar bear um, education program at the Assiniboia Park Zoo. So lots of the zoos are doing a lot to bring children in and to have K-12 programs um, for, um, for schools, for children, right, at low cost to try and engage children in conservation for species at risk, right, at these, at these zoos. So I think that's a very exciting thing that's happening uh, and we'd like to see more of that happen. Um, <clears throat> so all the zoos, I mean, were involved um, in communicating messages on species at risk. They all use multiple methods to do so. I really am hesitant to say too much. I mean, we really need more sort of research here onto how this is affecting people. So you go to the zoo, I mean, we would need to sort of know, like, did they actually retain any of that information, right? So when they're leaving the zoo, we sort of ask them. But then like two weeks later, do they remember anything that they read on that sign, right? Or it's also hard to know because you can go to a zoo and sort of have sort of like a meaningful interaction or kind of remembered or a child who sort of can't let something go. But maybe that also happens to be the same day or the same week that the last rhino dies in the world, right? Or last male dies, right? And that might actually hit you pretty hard, right? Because you might have just seen an exhibit about that at the zoo, right? And the combination of those two things then might actually change your attitudes or something. So it can be very difficult to assess whether or not zoos are educating or doing a good job with outreach because there could be a multitude of factors that are happening in your personal life or at school or something, right? Um, so I would need, I need to think more about how can we actually uh, judge sort of the effectiveness of what zoos are doing with awareness and education. But we do know that this is a large component of what zoos are doing. Um, and I do think that Canadian zoos, based on the number of programs that they're running for K-12 to and based on the sheer number of visitors that we would see, and the, this was in a, during uh, February, so the number of people that were coming to these zoos in February on a Tuesday or Wednesday uh, afternoon. Um, <coughs> and then these, finally, these, uh, there was also citizen science programs that we looked uh, at as well. Um, so trying to get citizens involved in, in the scientific undertakings at the zoo. Uh, but I did, I did not presenting that data, but that's another example of where uh, zoos have an, a role to play. So <coughs> why are zoos doing all of this stuff? So I've, I've talked to you about the multitude of ways that zoos are um, engaging with species at risk. And, and then we just sort of would ask the staff, you know, at the end of the interview or the last sort of five, 10 minutes, so why are you doing this? Um, and so this data coming mostly from the interviews I would say by and large they gave us one of two reasons. It's that we simply we have the space or we, and or we have the expertise. Um, and so zoos really felt that they, they have a lot of space to do this work. The Calgary Zoo specifically, um, the people that the seven interviews that we did there talked at length about um, some public lands that they own offsite um, where they are able to do captive breeding, where they're able to do a lot of research, um, <coughs> that, that this is sort of a public benefit. I mean, it's run as a charity, the zoo, right? Um, this is a good that we can provide, that we should provide, um, and we have the space and we have the resources. Like, the Canadian government doesn't have this, right? I mean, like, the Environment Canada, Environment Climate Change Canada, sorry, or DFO, right? They don't have sort of this type of 
They don't have the type of facilities where they're doing captive breeding or they're doing, like, yes, they can list species at risk and try and recover them in the wild, but they don't, they're not, they don't, they're not the type of institutions that can do the work that we can do. They don't have, like, sort of the space or the, or arguably, as another interviewee said, the, the expertise. Um, <coughs> zoo staff are obviously also well trained, very familiar with taking care of animals, have the veterinarian skills, have the actual scientists, uh, have the right people um, there to, to engage with species at risk work. Uh, and then oftentimes with zoo staff, they can be recognized as an authority on a particular species. So, so going back to Calgary Zoo, someone said there that one of their people is the authority on prairie dogs and ferrets. Um, since Parks Canada has lost its own staff. So in a time right from sort of 2005, 2006 I guess, to 2015, when the federal government was cutting a lot of funding to Parks Canada, to Environment Canada, to DFO, um, when they were actually changing the, the Fisheries Act, you know, reducing the amount of species that they were um, protecting, when they were cutting funding to science that, you know, the, the federal government was losing its expertise, it was losing its people, but the zoos were able to hire some of these people or the zoos were able to retain some of that expertise in Canada. And so they really felt like that is something that zoos have to contribute. Um, <coughs> so the problem though, right, and this is why we need to go back to this, is that even if zoos have the space and expertise, they're never going to be successful in Canada um, through captive breeding or head starting or reintroduction, right? if habitat's not being protected in the wild. So it's not a long-term strategy, right? I mean, zoos don't want to captive breed uh, if there isn't anywhere viable for reintroduction. Um, so if we're not saving habitat, if we're not protecting wild spaces, then what's even the point sort of of these, yes, we can have assurance populations, yes, they can live their lives out in zoos, but we never will have any hope of reintroducing them into the wild in Canada if we don't protect habitat. So <clears throat> this comes back to our provinces needing to do a much better job of protecting that habitat. And I say our provinces, right, because it really is provincial jurisdiction. I mean, it really is um, not, I mean, the federal government doesn't have as much jurisdiction here. Now we probably, you might have heard, right, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, the federal budget gave $1.3 billion to conservation in Canada over the next five years. So that was Trudeau government commitment to conservation. And what that money is earmarked for is uh, to increase federal capacity, protect species at risk, and put in new recovery initiatives for priority species areas uh, and threats to our environment. I'll just say on that, I don't know what that refers to. Um, I don't know what our priority species are. I've never heard the government talk about that. Um, we don't tend to think about species that way. Uh, I don't know if they're going after keystone species. I, I mean, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what that is, but that's what um, apparently we're maybe moving towards is thinking about maybe these are the species that are closest to extinction. Um, but money to increase federal capacity to protect these species and recovery initiatives, <coughs> we wanna expand uh, national wildlife areas and migratory bird sanctuaries. And this would go with increasing federal capacity to manage protected areas, including <coughs> national parks. So Canada committed our 2020 commitment right under the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, which we signed in 1992. Um, one of our commitments under that is to have 17% of terrestrial areas protected um, by 2020. So 17% of our land protected uh, by 2020, does anyone know what we're at right now? What is it? No, it's better than that. But we're about 10%. Well, we yeah, we've increased a bit. Um, although I do think there's funny calculations going on perhaps about what counts as a wildlife area or what counts as a park. Um, like for example, in Saskatch I'm from Saskatchewan and I'm doing a big project in Saskatchewan right now, so that's why a lot of my examples are from there. But like the Moose Provincial Park, um, they count as a protected area, but they allow fracking inside the park. So, I mean, like, is that a protected area? I mean, like, protected from what? If I'm like, if you're not even protecting it from oil and gas, I don't know why you get to call it a protected area. Uh, it's not clear to me, I mean, like, what are you, what, like, protected from hunting? Like, I don't, so, so I think there's sort of is funny things about getting us even to 10% uh, about what we're constituting as a protected area. Um, 
But this is a big, like the federal, I mean, so we have two years, right, to go from 10% of our area as being protected to 17%. Um, that's a lot of protected area in the next two years. Um, Harper's government was putting out a lot of parks in the north, right? I mean, that's sort of an easier, the federal government has a lot of, a lot of property in the north, um, and there's a lot of less opposition or stakeholders, I guess, involved, so it was easier to make parks in the north. It's much more contentious to do it uh, in highly populated areas or inside provinces, um, but they're gonna have to do something, right? And what they're probably gonna have to do is work with provinces to get more protected areas. But that's the type of thing we need, right? 17% um, of our terrestrial area is protected for, um, if we're ever, if zoos work, right, and captive breeding and reintroduction is actually gonna work, we need these safe spaces to reintroduce species into. So this is certainly um, a, an initiative that seems key. Um, continued implementation of SARA by supporting the assessment, listing, recovery, uh, and action plan activities. Again, here, this is really, they, have, they don't have the staff. They haven't been putting out federal recovery strategies or action plans. They, they literally haven't had the staff or the resources to do that. Um, so that's a major undertaking which the federal government is going to do. And then establishing a coordinated network of conservation areas, working with provincial, territory, and indigenous partners. And this one seems to me to be the most critical, given that the provinces have the jurisdiction here, that this is really a provincial uh, issue that we need you know, Ontario to do something for protected areas, that the federal government can't do that for us. Um, so, <coughs> I, I mean, uh, to bring it back, we do have sort of tame or lame policy in Canada when it comes for species at risk, in part because federalism, uh, in part because I don't think a lot of Canadians understand that it works that way. Um, they think that this is something that the federal government would do, or, oh, we have the Species at Risk Act, we're good, we're covered, right? We got that. Uh, they're not understanding that this is something that the provinces do, and then also not really um, going to the provinces and looking for that type of legislation, which is what we really um, do need. So yes, of course we need zoos. Uh, it'd be crazy to come here and say we didn't. Um, we, for the reasons I outlined, right, for everything that they're doing for, for captive breeding, for reintroduction and head starting, for what they're doing with recovery processes, I think there's a lot more um, that zoos could be doing, um, should be doing, being involved in the recovery process for um, animals, but that will, won't come without increased funding to these zoos. Like staff want to get involved with more recovery um, processes. They'd love to be on recovery teams, but they don't have the time, they don't have the resources, they don't have the staff. Um, education and awareness, the space and the expertise, but really it's going to be about these last two things, right? We need better policy, and then of course we need better research about zoos in Canada. I've only talked to you about four zoos, and three in most cases because we had to exclude uh, in Assiniboia because they don't have provincial recovery strategies. Um, but we need more people thinking about, learning about what zoos are doing uh, for conservation of species at risk across the country. I mean, what are non-accredited zoos doing? Maybe they're doing a lot too, I don't know, right? What are the zoos in Quebec doing? What, so how are we engaging? Um, how are our zoos, what are they doing for, for species at risk? Uh, across the country. Um, okay, I will leave it at that. So I think we have time for questions, right? Yeah, if sure anyone has questions. questions. Yeah. I'll start. Yeah, go for uh, it. So 31 out of 314 uh, reports were this uh, recovery plans. Yeah. And the federal government mentioned the zoo. Yeah. Like 10%. Even less for provincial plans, recovery plans. Yeah. Or a fewer, fewer percentage. Yeah. Does that seem like a lot? I don't know. I mean, does it seem like a lot? I mean, I want to say no. Can, can, I say that, can I just ask, is that restricted to animals? No. Or, or is so that's restricted plans? to anything that would have a recovery plan in it. Like, almost very few plants have a recovery. So there's like a bias in listing, and yep. then there's a bias in who we, who or what, whatever. The right. charismatic species that we write recovery plans for sure, first, sure, sure, right? Sure, um, so there's already somewhat bias in the data just on what type of species would even have a recovery plan. Okay. But out of those that do have a recovery plan that the federal government has put together since 2002, yeah. how many of them would list a zoo? Only 10% would list a zoo as partnering, as working yeah, with them. Yeah, so as in my mind that sounds like really low. Yeah. I guess I went into it thinking like probably none. I, I didn't yeah. know that zoos were doing as much as they're doing. Is, what's the capacity of zoos to contribute? Yeah, to 
And this is where every zoo was like, yes, we would love to be doing more, right? right. Um, but <coughs> they they don't have the staff and the resources. I mean, of course, I guess, like, right, that's what, what they're always going to tell you. They're never going to be like, we're lush with money. We have all the time in the world. Like, no institution has ever said that ever. Um, so in part, but I mean, that you really do believe them that they are trying to do everything they can at the zoo, and right. they don't get paid to be on a recovery team, right? There's no, no, no compensation. So it's like, why would I, I mean, other than my sheer love of the animal, but that's here in my own lab. This is, uh -huh. I'm right here right now <laughs> doing captive breeding, right? Yeah, like, yeah. to have to fly to Ottawa or to like, you know, whatever. So I think it's partly the incentive to be on a recovery team or to get involved is a bit low. Um, but I also think like something like low hanging fruit, like education and awareness, the federal government could be doing could easily be funding that at zoos, right? So when we know that there's Ontario species are at risk, we know which ones those are, we know which ones have federal recovery strategies, to actually give funding to the Toronto Zoo to create education and awareness um, yeah. at the zoo itself, right? Like that's an easy thing so that- So as an aside, we need to talk to Chantal Barrio. Okay. She's here, she runs the PSYCOM program, okay. and her PhD is on, on education. Yeah, so like that's History. like, to me, that's like an easy, like the federal government should have funding for that. That could be an easy thing. And that's an easy way to connect like kids and people in Ontario to the species that are at risk here through education at the zoo. Yeah, and what are you counting as education at the zoo? Is it just a sign or a program? That so yeah, there? so we were looking um, for the citizen science programs, for the K to 12 programs, and then for actual like exhibits and then or, and or signage. And we also, and then this kind of got harder because it's so inconsistent across the four, but this is where we were going to their Facebook pages, their Twitter pages, looking at their brochures. Like, so I would love a s energetic student who has a way to systematically think this out and like do this research, right? But like how, how could we measure that or what would be some gauges because, you know, and to be able to do it consistently. Um, sort of because like meeting young people where they are like the instagram pages right or like how many i mean most of toronto zoos is just the pandas right but like how else could the toronto zoo be engaging their instagram feed for species at risk right that are being so thinking about even stuff like that but yeah i mean because there's like old school education the way we tend to think of it and then actually what what are youth today how are they learning and how is that different and where should we look for that uh, at a zoo and what are zoos doing and so that I envision as a whole big separate project but something that really should be done um, because I think there's a lot that zoos can be doing to easily engage yeah uh, do you think like the size and scale of the kind of institution has an effect on this education sector because I feel like the Toronto Zoo with all the international animals that it has yeah. that aren't just local you kind of lose any kind of real like Whereas yeah. Science North in Northern Ontario, like we have a science center and the animals we have mostly are like local indigenous to this northern yeah. area, like biosphere. So yeah. I'm just wondering, like, are our zoos ultimately that effective if you have that diversity of species there? Like I, I It's a lot know. of information to take in for sure when you're at the zoo, like when you're at the Toronto Zoo, and like at the Toronto Zoo, like you gotta you gotta earn that Canadian exhibit. You gotta want it because you gotta walk all the way down, right? <laughs> down that hill, down to that Canadian, and then you gotta walk yourself back out of there, right? Like that Canadian, most people wanna take a pass on it all together, right? Like I've seen, you know, a bear or whatever. I, they have like raccoons at the Toronto Zoo. It's hilarious, right? Like people are like, I'm not walking down into that abyss that I have to walk back out of just to see a raccoon. Um, so I hear what you're saying. And I do think too, like, I, like this is where we we'd really need, and I've seen some studies of, of, in the United States of this, and I would like to see this in Canada, where they actually try and like do exit interviews with people who visited the zoo. So what exhibits did you go to? Like, what do you sort of remember? Like, did you see this? What did you learn about? Like, so to get a better sense of where people are interacting with what at the zoo, because I think a lot of people are drawn to charismatic animals from other countries. Um, and so the experience that you're talking about in a local sort of smaller place that is really focused on the local is probably a far more enriching experience for the visitor. Um, in terms of what can I, sort of what's in my backyard, what can I do, what should I be thinking about right here at home? Not that international like conservation isn't important because it is, but from a you know a species at risk program here in Canada, what you're the type of institution that you're talking about, I think, and we need more research on what are those institutions doing, what kind of funding is available to them, what type of, but that would really require sort of these exit interviews, I think surveys five you know weeks later five months later like 
do people even retain the information or what do they remember about their experience at the zoo like you know when you ask a 10 year old like you know we went to the zoo last year like what do you remember about it what do they just remember the lion or do they remember the raccoon right like i don't know so doing you know more trash. understanding yeah what call the trash panda. yeah the trash panda sorry you're right uh <laughs> understanding <laughs> and they actually are right next to the trash cans at the Toronto Zoo. Like the, it's funny, yeah, yeah. right? I, it right, has to be intentional. That has to be a joke. Yeah. You see the trash can, but they're right behind the fence. They can't reach it. So yeah, I think it is a big horror. joke. I think it's like an inside joke at the Toronto Zoo. Oh, we have to stop that now. Okay. We'll take a 15-minute break, and then we'll uh, we'll start. Uh, okay. Again. Perfect. Thank you.